content warning. This episode contains discussion of murder and violence. Also, as a quick note, a lot of helpful listeners reached out to us to let us know that we pronounced a lot of things wrong in our first episode on Idaho. We have noted that, and we will work to do better in the future. We do apologize for our mispronunciations. Just as a note, a couple of our upcoming Idaho episodes we recorded before we were aware we were mispronouncing things, so please bear with us and note that we will attempt to pronounce everything correctly going forward. Thanks again for reaching out to us, and sorry about the mispronunciations. Last week, authorities released the probable cause affidavit for the arrest of Brian Kohlberger in the Idaho quadruple homicides. We offered our own reactions to it in an episode we released last week. But, just as we did in our coverage of the PCA in the Richard Allen case, we decided to reach out to experts in this field to get their perspectives. In this episode, we will be talking with a veteran defense attorney with many years of experience handling extremely serious cases, including murder cases. You will likely recognize his voice as we also interviewed him about the Delphi case. Since he is still very actively practicing law, we are not mentioning his name, but we independently verified his identity and his level of experience. My name is Anya Kane. I'm a journalist. And I'm Kevin Greenlee. I'm an attorney. We first connected while looking into the Burger Chef murders, an Indiana cold case. Together, we built a spreadsheet documenting hundreds of cases of restaurant-related homicides. That original spreadsheet gave way to our podcast, The Murder Sheet. Now we maintain that same research-centric, investigative approach as we look into all sorts of homicides including unsolved cases, historical crimes, and, of course, restaurant murders. We don't just chat about the headlines. Our podcast is a platform for our journalism. The Murder Sheet focuses on investigative reporting, thoughtful analysis, thorough research, and in-depth interviews. We're the Murder Sheet, and this is the University of Idaho Murders a defense attorney's perspective on the Kohlberger PCA. When you read through the PCA in this case, were were there things that uh, stood out to you? Uh, there was uh, there was quite a bit. Um, you know, when uh, when I receive a case, um, it, I, I, I normally don't get an affidavit quite like this. I um, I usually get a, a bare bones affidavit in the beginning, and then it, the evidence is fleshed out uh, completely in in the discovery process. And uh, when I get the discovery, I'm always looking at what evidence does the prosecution have to use against my client for each element of the crime? And in this particular case, I don't think there's any doubt that there were four murders that occurred. I mean, these were, they, you know, there were stabbings or uh, slashings. They, they died an unnatural death at an early age. So, so the question of whether it was a, a crime at all is, I think, an answered question without any doubt. But in all cases, in all criminal cases, you have uh, an element of identity that has to be proven. Yep, the, the prosecution can have to prove identity. And so, as um, as I went through this uh, this uh, affidavit, I was looking to see what is it that the that the prosecution has to prove that Brian Koberger, and to the exclusion of other people, that he's the one that committed the crime, and. You know, I approach it as a defense lawyer, so I think that there are um, a lot of things that can be called into question uh, until we get to the close to the end of the affidavit, where they start discussing DNA, and that is 
or if I were a defense lawyer on this case, I'd once I got to that point, I'd start worrying quite a bit. Um, and um, you know, this is just an affidavit, just like in Delphi. This is, you know, you don't to, to arrest somebody, you don't have to explain to the judge everything you know. You just have to explain to a judge enough for the judge to believe there's probable cause that this person committed the crime. And so I think there's probably quite a bit that has been left out of this affidavit, just like in Delphi. But unlike in Delphi, this affidavit on its face is pretty strong. You mentioned that until you got to the part with the DNA, there was like a lot of things that a a defense attorney could potentially work with. Could you discuss some of those? Um, Yeah. You know, as as I'm reading through this, I see lots of discussion about how uh, his phone uh, supposedly traveled from point A to point B, and his car was supposedly seen at different locations. You know, when you see things like that in evidence, um, as a defense lawyer, you can, you can you, you just ask yourself, if I'm going to have to convince somebody that that was not my client, um, what would I what would I do? Um, and those those things, um, there's you know, it's pretty certain that the vehicle seen um, on these videos was his vehicle. And it's pretty clear that, that the phone that was traveling was his phone. So, I mean, I don't think there's a way to attack that, that part of it, that it's whether those, the vehicle or the, the phone are his or not. But, you know, you can you just, why would a, a phone and a car be traveling in a place uh, that belonged to my client that uh, my client's not with those items? I mean, he could have let somebody borrow. He could have, he could have left the phone in his vehicle overnight for some reason. I, I think most people would take their phones with them wherever they go, but, you know, and then maybe his, uh, maybe his vehicle was stolen that night and maybe it was brought back. You know, that's, um, that's something that does happen. And I, I can't think of a concrete example, but you know, people, uh, in, in historically, uh, people will steal a car and commit a crime and, and then, um, and then ditch the car or bring it back. I mean, that sort of thing can happen. Um, but and so there are so you, I, I just look at these kind the discovery and or the affidavits and ask myself what what can what can I come up with what sounds reasonable to create a reasonable doubt that even if this were my client's car even if his phone were, were traveling in this location that it wasn't my client that was with the car or the phone and so those are, that's that's at least a couple of reasonable things that I can I can think of probably unlikely of course but those are at least a couple of reasonable things that could have occurred and so i just always want to find alternative hypotheses for whatever fact that the state has that is incriminating against my client and then you mentioned the dna being kind of something that uh might be more difficult for a defense attorney to contend with can you speak to that a bit there is a lot about this dna that is interesting to me as a defense lawyer who i've done a lot of work in the with dna uh uh, as far as litigation purposes, I've never done forensic biology, forensic DNA profiling, but uh, I feel like I have as good of an understanding of that as most lay people do. And um, <clears throat> one of the interesting things that I've noticed is that they, they secured a sample from the trash at his parents' home, and one day later, uh, well, they secured the sample in Pennsylvania. One day later in Idaho, they had already created a profile. You know, you hear all the time uh, where people say that this DNA process is a, a lengthy process and it, you know, takes years and, and, and at least months a lot of time. It's a, it's not that. It doesn't take that long. It's just a question of prioritizing. And uh, if you, it's a two or three hours you can have sample uh, from sample to profile within just two or three hours if you want to. And so that was interesting to me. It probably means enough for his defense. But, um, but what it, what, I, I have heard some some discussion on other uh, other uh, YouTube channels and such that this was um, familial DNA or uh, meaning Y chromosome DNA, and I'll I'll come back and explain explain all this. Um, but I've all, and I've also heard that it was um, it was um, um, the genealogical DNA at work in this case. But I don't think either of those are true. First of all, uh, genealogical DNA is the process of getting a sample, creating a profile from that sample, and then taking that sample to a genealogical database of whatever sort, 23andMe, you know, Ancestry.com, that sort of thing, um, and finding if the person who left that sample has relatives. And once you do that, then you 
trace those relatives to figure out who among their relatives could be that person who left that sample. And, uh, and that's a lengthy process. I mean, anybody who's ever done any kind of genealogy work would knows that finding relatives takes time. It takes effort. It, you got to look through a lot of databases. And so I don't think that, um, I, I don't think there, there was not enough time in my opinion for this to be genealogical work, but also there are, there, um, I mean, there's nuclear DNA and there's mitochondrial DNA. Mitochondrial DNA is not something that is used forensically very much. Um, but so you got in nuclear DNA, you've got two different kinds. You've got the sex link chrom- uh, chromosomal DNA and you've got autosomal DNA. So, Autosomal DNA is just your standard DNA profiling, and you, you uh, the, they create a profile that um, is, that according to the National Academy of Sciences, actually does have the potential for individualization. So it's very specific. That's where you get these figures of, you know, one in uh, 400 billion people could have had this profile. It's statistically um, it's, uh, proven through through the the specificity of the particular alleles that are expressed in that DNA. But that is contrasted with Y chromosome DNA. And Y chromosome is kind of similar to mitochondrial DNA in that it is passed down from father to son, whereas mitochondrial is, is, is mother to child. Um, and so, but father to son, and it, it, it basically that DNA uh, analysis targets the Y chromosome, which is when, it, when it's expressed in, in, a, in a cell means that the person who has that cell is a male person. So you're looking on the male-specific chromosome to find uh, matches. And what, when you do that, um, you know, I have, I have sons, I have a father, I have brothers. We all have the same uh, Y chromosome. And, you know, statistically speaking, about once every 50 generations, what I've been told is the latest um, uh, 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 scholarship on that, there's a mutation, and it'll change. A father and a son will have a different Y chromosome. But, uh, but so it's almost consistent for, for, for pretty much everybody that's alive. They have the boys have the same Y chromosome as their father, and so a lot of people I've heard saying, "Well, they got his father's DNA, and therefore, when they say 99.98 percent chance that the sample was left by the son of that person, it's it's Y chromosome DNA." That's that's not. I don't think that's true because it's a, it would be a hundred percent or it would be zero percent if it, if it were Y chromosome DNA. Um, what there, what this is, is, is showing that, that the person who uh, contributed that sample is, uh, it, it, the, is the son of that person based on the, the, uh, the percentages associated with the expression of each elite. So getting a little bit complicated, but basically what, what this, uh, this means is this is the specific kind of DNA rather than the general kind of DNA. And it can pretty much tell you who is the person that left it. And so they've stopped at, in this affidavit at saying that the father of Brian Coburg is 99.98% certainly the father of the person who left the sample. But I'm quite certain there's going to be a, a lot more DNA that's done, um, that a lot more work that will be done to uh, confirm that it is uh, Brian Coburg's DNA that found it. And that kind of science is, uh, unlike the, the uh, tool mark examination that we spoke about in Delphi, is pretty solid evidence. It's, uh, it's reliable. It's been proven reliable since, uh, since it was first used in, I think, 1987 in, in England, and, and it's been used uh, reliably ever since then all over the world. And, uh, and uh, the technology has developed to, to such a point, and it's been used so routinely that it's going to be, there's absolutely no way that a uh, defense lawyer, in my opinion, can attack it. It's, it's, going, it's going to have to be explained away. You mentioned the Delphi case and the Delphi PCA that we previously discussed, and I was wondering, are there any other parallels or, or contradictions you can sort of draw between those two PCAs? I think to Kevin and I, when we're looking through them both, you know, Delphi certainly feels a lot thinner than the Idaho one, but I guess, you know, in your expert opinion, could you speak to some of those, um, you know, contrast them, I guess? It, it, yeah, I can see a lot of things that, um, that make them quite a contrast. And I'm, you know, I, I'm, I don't, 
mean to disparage anybody by saying this, but I'm I'm kind of a grammar nerd, and I noticed that in Idaho there was maybe two punctuation mistakes. The grammar and 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 the punctuation, the style was it was really well written. So either somebody wrote it really well right off the, the top, or it was it was thoroughly vetted through a chain of command. And um, I think there are you know there were some some grammar mistakes and some some typographical errors. Uh, such as the the date in uh, in the Delphi affidavit, it makes you think just from a from a cursory examination that maybe they didn't do the work that needed to be done to go into this, and so that's a you know I know that it seems kind of like a shallow analysis, but to me, if if a document is well prepared, that means that that I I, I feel like I can take uh, uh, I, can, I can I can rely on it much more solidly than if it's, uh, if it's prepared. But, um, you know, that's, um, using that same analysis on Delphi that I used with this one, I looking at identity. I mean, we obviously know there were murders. I just don't see a lot of solid identity in the Delphi, um, affidavit. And I, I don't know if, you know, if judges are, are peculiar, uh, for a lot of reasons, but they're they're people, and you got to know your judges as as a as a prosecutor, as a law enforcement officer, as a defense lawyer, and you've got to know what they'll accept. And I and, and it appears that in Del- in Indiana they will uh, they will accept uh, an assertion from a law enforcement officer that is a little less lacking than apparently they do in Idaho in order to make a finding of probable cause. Um, and I I don't mean any you know I'm, again I'm not disparaging anybody when I say that, but if you know that all you have to provide is just the bare minimum, then that's all you're going to really want to provide as a law enforcement officer. And that's what it, it looks like to me that, that that affidavit is quite a bit thinner in Delphi than it is in Idaho. Uh, you mentioned that you really can't explain away the, uh, the DNA evidence in this case. So I'm curious what, or whether you can't attack it. So how does a defense attorney in a case like that deal with strong evidence that you can't attack the validity of you just have to find an explanation um you know uh, going back to my um um to my analysis earlier of the of the vehicle and the and the phone moving around you know one explanation for the the sheet being in his uh being in their uh, room with his dna on it is well it was his knife and somebody stole my car and my phone was in it and they took it over there and and they did this thing, you know, and that you've got to come up with alternative explanations uh, that are reasonable. And, you know, at some point, you know, you get to, to, to a place where you can't explain it away. And whether your client's telling you the truth that, you know, hey, yeah, it really was me, but I need you to find an explanation or they're just lying to you or maybe they really are innocent. You've got to figure out some way to explain what happened. And, but if it gets to a point where it's strong enough, then you have to start talking to a client about, you know, the reality of the situation is this is solid science that they're using, and this is the evidence that they've got. Um, you know, if I would, be, I'll, I'll tell you that I'm gonna, I would be very surprised if this, if it does go to trial, I'll be very surprised that this is the only piece of identity evidence that they have, uh, and particularly the DNA. I'm in in um, in Idaho, they'll almost certainly have more DNA evidence that will connect him to that crime. Um, but you just have to find a way to explain it away. And, it, it, uh, you know, playing defense is tough sometimes, and that's uh, one of those tough situations when the evidence is overwhelming. You have to have a tough conversation with a client about what's the next option. You're either going to lose or we need to consider uh, enter, enter into, entering into strong plea negotiations. I'm curious in in terms of, you know, we, we kind of spoke a bit about this in regards to Delphi, but it's sort of happening again with Idaho, is just the element of media scrutiny on this case. And mm-hmm. as a defense attorney, if you are at the center of, of such a storm, essentially, in terms of not just national, but international coverage, uh, how do you navigate that situation? Or what sort of strategies can you Im- employ in order to help mitigate that? Well, you know, it is interesting. I've had some cases that have had uh, a fair bit of media coverage prior to the trial. Nothing like uh, Indiana, nothing like Idaho. But I, I've had some 
that were like that. And it, it really, uh, it depends on the, the necessity of the case. Um, you know, you, if, if there's already, you know, you got to consider what your jurisdiction is. First of all, if you're, if the case is being prosecuted in a very conservative area where they're very likely to convict, then, and there's a, a lot of talk in the media about the case, well, you just, just let it ride, you know, you, you, and you gather all the information and then use that as your, um, as, as the basis for a, a motion to, to change the venue. Um, if the coverage is strong and, and you're in the jurisdiction you want to be in, well, then you've got to figure out whether it's worth responding to that or not responding to it. You've got to find a, uh, what's the, for this particular case, what's the right touch. And, and I, I basically, and there's a, a couple of things that I look at when I'm, when I'm considering that number one, the strength of the case. And, um, and, um, in, in other words, what are they talking about specific pieces of, of information? And, uh, and number two, what's the public reaction? You know, uh, back in the day, uh, years ago, uh, when I first started practicing, you didn't have all the social media outlets that you have now, and you, uh, you don't really know what the public is thinking about the case. But on Facebook and Twitter and all, all of the social media platforms and the comments sections of the, the various websites, you can find out if the public is saying, hang this guy, then... You, you might need to, to develop a, a, a counter uh, strategy to, to get your information out there that is important to your, uh, for the public to know. Um, but it's also a good, it's a good tool to determine what people are thinking about. When you see what, what social media is, is posting, uh, what the comment sections are, are, and the newspapers are saying, if that's your jury pool, then you know what they're saying. And you can, and you know, you, it's a, you know, every, every case is different. They're all unique and you've got to respond uh, to that particular case. But I'm, I take generally take the position that it's better to, to be quiet than to put yourself in a position where you announce the defense and then you have to stick with it. And, uh, and so, you know, I, I, I look at that media coverage to determine um, if there are specific pieces of evidence that are being laid out then I may need to, to, to refute that somehow publicly so that that way that the public knows that there is a defense uh, to the particular piece of evidence. But if it's generally just a talk among the community without reference to a lot of the specifics, then I just I sit back and I see what people are saying, and then I figure out if I need to respond. But generally, generally I don't. I, I, just, I don't think it, it's helpful uh, to put yourself in a position on the front end but, uh, but like, like I said, if there's specific pieces of evidence that you can explain away, maybe you want that out in the public because um, people will see it a little more and it, it'll give them the idea of a reminder. Yeah, there are two sides to every story. And I'm curious, you know, I guess we try on the podcast to, and you know, as journalists, essentially to not put the cart before the horse in terms of, you know, saying, oh, this guy's guilty, you know, look at all this evidence. Um, obviously, because he's not been tried yet, there's there's been no resolution to the case. Um, mm -hmm. You know, when you do have a case that is a lot stronger, like this one, uh, you know, what sort of advice would you give for people who are covering this to kind of keep an open mind, despite the fact that we do have a lot of strong evidence outlined in this PCA at this point? You know, that's an interesting question, and, and both times that we've talked, you've, you've you stumped me <laughs> with good questions like that. I, I try to anticipate, but that's a, that's a really good question. Um, you know, I think it's just important to remind people that you have, you know, the, they haven't even heard from the defense in this case. The only thing that we've heard that I, that I know of is a, a lawyer was appointed to represent him who stood up and said, we'd like to have a bail, you know, and that's all that has been said on his behalf yet. And until, um, you know, there are, I, I can point, dozens of cases out probably where the evidence was so very damning on the front end. And, you know, you think about exonerations off the of death row and out of prison. Those people were in prison or on death row because they were convicted and yet they were innocent. So I, I, what I'm getting at is until the entire story is told, 
you really don't know what happened. And that is the beauty of the system that we have in the United States. We don't have an, uh, an inquisitorial system like France or other places. We have an, an adversarial system where the state has the burden to prove that a defendant did something that, is, that he should be held criminally responsible for. And until they provided evidence that satisfies the jury beyond a reasonable doubt, then that person is supposed to remain unconvicted and unimprisoned. And so our system is set up well. It's just, you know, sometimes there are flaws in the system, but the system is set up well. And until you've heard from the other side, you you don't know what the whole story is. And so, I, you know, it's a... Um, what do you tell listeners? How do you handle that from, from your podcast? I mean, I think that's all you really can do is say, but we haven't heard from the other side yet. We don't know what their explanation is. Um, there is all of this incriminating evidence, you know, and you can point to specific things, but, but we don't know what they're going to say about it. And um, until, until you get to that trial, uh, that it may be until you get to trial before you'll actually hear what, they're, what the other side is. And so uh, you just have to continually point that out. But we don't, we haven't heard the other side yet. What sort of things are you looking for to happen next in the process that our listeners should be aware of? If there is a vigorous preliminary hearing, um, there will be a lot of new evidence that will come out. Um, officers, one or more officers will testify. They'll have to establish probable cause ag- again um, to the satisfaction of a, of a magistrate, a neutral judge. And they will be under oath cross and subject to cross examination. Um, I took a look at the Idaho rules, and that's the way it seems like it is, uh, and it sh- as it should be. Uh, they'll they'll be testifying live and um, um, subject to cross examination. And so uh, that is, uh, as I understand it, uh, within 14 days of the initial appearance. Uh, it sounds like, based on the announcements made by the defense lawyer, that that could be put off some. But I think in the next month or so, there will be a preliminary hearing that will probably have quite a number of bombshells that will, uh, that will be detrimental to the defense case. Um, but, but you want to flesh that out as early as you can as a defense lawyer, because you don't have discovery yet. Um, uh, most places, uh, you're not entitled to full discovery until you go to trial. So they're not going to have discovery. They're not going to know what the state knows. They're not going to know what to defend against, what, uh, experts might be out there until they get, that information from a from an officer on the stand at the preliminary hearing. So I think they're going to use it as a as a discovery tool, although it's generally not supposed to be used like that. But that's what I think is going to be the next big step is that preliminary hearing. There's going to be a lot of damning evidence probably that's going to be elicited from the state. I guess, I mean, we kind of breeze through a lot of our questions about this. Do you have anything else that you're keeping in mind for Idaho that – you think it's important for people to sort of be thinking about or, or, you know, questions, I guess, that you have at this point um, that you, you know, are looking to get answers for in terms of the process or what's next or information about the case itself? Yes, I, I have a lot of observations that I think are, I, I think are, you know, I don't want to pat myself on the back, but I think might be insightful. You know, this sort of has a, a, a like a modern day Leopold and Loeb kind of feel to it. The Leopold Loeb case was an instance in which two young Chicagoans decided to commit a murder more or less for the thrill of it and to prove they were smart enough to get away with the crime. As our guest notes, the pair made a crucial mistake by leaving behind a piece of incriminating evidence, exactly as Brian Koberger is alleged to have done. But this guy, you know, thinks that he's smarter than everybody else and he can get away with it. And yet, like uh, Leopold and Loeb, they dropped their glasses and uh, and were able they were able to tie him to the crime very quickly. You know, he's made a lot of what what seemed to be silly mistakes. And I I wonder um, what happened there, what caused that. But, um, you know, there in this affidavit, there are several things that are very interesting from an evidentiary standpoint. And, um, and I'm, I'm saying that not necessarily as a defense lawyer, but, but as a defense lawyer from, from that perspective. And so, you know, first of all, there's been a lot of hand wringing on, on the Internet about this person who was on the second floor and saw him coming out. Our guest is referring to the witness identified in the affidavit as DM. According to that affidavit, DM saw the killer as he was in the process of leaving the crime scene. Some people have been critical of DM, but our guest does not agree with those perspectives. I just don't see it that way. 
what what I see is that it says a lot about how many people would come and go at odd hours of the night and day at that particular house that she didn't immediately call 911. I think that's all it says, is that there's a lot of people in and out of that house. And so I, I don't think that there's anything mysterious going on there. I just think that, and, you know, alcohol being what, uh, as pervasive as it is on college campuses, she, you know, who knows what the level of intoxication was uh, among those survivors. But, but that, it just raises it, you know, what's the point of walking right by this, this person and leaving them alive if you've already stabbed four other people? You know, it's, that's a, a, just a question that I, I think is going to have to be analyzed. I don't know that it's important legally, but it, it says something about this crime, and I'm not sure exactly what. Our guest also had some strong opinions about the knife sheath that was found at the crime scene. It bore the insignia of the U.S. Marine Corps. You know, as, as, a, as a, a person who was in the Marine Corps at one point, it, it just pains me to know that there was a, uh, uh, an implement of death that was taken to that house that has our symbol on it. Um, Marine Corps is about protection. We're not about rampant and wanton death. Um, and it just pains me to know that that that, um, that that symbol is on that sheath that was left there. I think that the sheath being found in the bed where the two girls were on the third floor probably says something about who was the target. I mean, you don't leave a sheath in the second place where you kill somebody. You know, you take the knife out of a sheath and you start stabbing or cutting. And then that's when the sheath falls out. I, 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 you know, it surprised me to know that he killed somebody on the second floor and resheathed his his uh, knife or took the sheath separate away from the knife and went to the third floor, and that's where he dropped it. And to me, it seems like that probably indicates that's where it started. Um, and, and, you know, it's interesting that, that um, the uh, uh, Zana's body was, it says here, was found on the floor, but it doesn't say where Ethan's body was found. At all, it doesn't say if he was in bed or where you know where he was, and so I, I as a, I, again, I don't know if it's important for the for the case, but it just seems interesting that that they didn't mention it. Whether that was uh, purposeful or not, I don't know. And uh, could he be his body falling and hitting the floor be the thud that that the camera picked up next door? I mean, there's just a lot of little things like that, and it may not, you know, as, as, and back putting on my lawyer hat again, it may not be important for the case. But this is a weird little thing that three bodies, we were told where three bodies were, the fourth we weren't. You know, tuck that away. Maybe that's important. Maybe they don't want us to know for some reason. Maybe it was just a mistake, you know. But you know, there, there was a lot of things that just weren't discussed at all, you know, in this in this affidavit. And, of course, some of it is because they don't they won't have full knowledge on those subjects until later on down the road anyway. But, you know, surely many of his devices were seized. I understand there was a search warrant at his apartment and that a computer was taken. I mean, I, I haven't seen the documents, but that's what I, I understand. You know, no information about the information on his devices. We, we don't know whether they recovered the, a shoe that supposedly made the shoe print in the blood. Um, we, we don't know where the murder weapon is at all. There's just, there's a lot that's not discussed, but it's subject to further investigation. And I'm sure that they're going to be doing that, or they already know some of these things and they just haven't told us. There, this is an interesting case because it's rare to have a quadruple homicide anywhere. It's probably got to be even far rarer to have it happen by, by anything other than a firearm. And then in that location where those four people died, there are two people who's survive and who weren't even attacked as far as we know how rare is that that's got to be extremely rare and it just there's a, a feeling here that that there's a, a story that is under that's a subtext that we just don't know the whole thing and we don't need to know it's like you never know you don't have to know the motive to convict someone legally you, there, this subtext that i'm talking about we may never know you don't we don't need to know it in order for the state or the prosecution there to be able to con- to convince jury a jury beyond a reasonable doubt, but it but it sure seems that like it's going to be a fascinating story if we ever get to it. And and I, I know you probably have questions, but I'm going to I'm my memory is not as good as it used to be now that I'm old. But let me I want to point out something else that I think is 
uh, part of the subtext that we're not being told. But I've got kind of put together some information on page three and page eleven of the, of the affidavit. You know, we 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 thought that the that the that the murders occurred in the three o'clock a.m. hour. That's what has kind of been popularly reported. But this is saying um, sometime after four o'clock is when the murders happened, and, and and they think they know that because there was a DoorDash order at the residence at approximately four o'clock in the morning. And law enforcement identified the DoorDash delivery driver who reported the information, according to that, uh, to the affidavit. So the question that I immediately had is, how does Brian Coburg get that lucky, it, or whoever the person is that did the crime, how do they get that lucky that they got to these people at 417 or whatever time it's, it's being reported, you know, moments later? There's a DoorDash delivery person at the door, and 17 minutes later, there's an attack, or could even be left. How did he get that luck? Well, I, you know, on page 13, um, they they say that he has undergraduate degrees in psychology and cloud-based forensics. Was the question that that immediately raises in my mind is. Did he have remote access to one or more of their devices somehow? And he knew when people were coming and going? Did he know what was going I mean, obviously there's just the, the standard stalker method of looking at an Instagram account. But did it, with what appears to be uh, some education in that field, did he find a way to have access to know what they were doing and know what was going on in that house? I mean, to me it is... I mean, it, did he show up and wait for that DoorDash driver to come in and leave? Or was, you know, it's, that is just, it is a coincidence beyond anything that I've, I've seen in a long time that, that there was a person who came in at four and 17 minutes later, he was in that house stabbing. How did he not get caught or be, be in that house stabbing these people as this DoorDash driver was coming? I mean, it, it's just a, there's, it, there's a lot, it raises a lot of questions in my mind that as a, a defense lawyer I'd be asking about, but as a member of the public, it just makes this seem like there's something more going on than just a random quadruple murder. Yeah, that's, that's really well said. And, and, you know, and I think your point about also that you mentioned earlier about the witness, you know, the way I think about that is that you know, oftentimes we do have instincts that are correct, but due to wanting to, you know, not make a scene or embarrass ourselves or embarrass other people or get other people in trouble, mm-hmm. you, you know, we might suppress them. So I can see a situation where you are momentarily frightened by the appearance of a strange man that you don't know in your house, but then you put it in the context of, well, some of my friends who live here may be single. They may have, you know, male friends over, um, romantic partners. They may have just other people over who, you know, just strictly platonic, but maybe they're up night, up at night talking and mm-hmm. taking it from, you know, this is a murderer who just murdered everybody else in the house to, you know, I mean, like, that's not necessarily the first thing that's going to occur to somebody, especially if they're not necessarily very much concerned about crime. And they, exactly. Your brain's going to look for an innocent explanation and then, you know, you're going to go to bed. And then when you wake up in the morning and maybe things are different. So I think people second guessing such a young person, um, especially when we don't know level of intoxication, level of sleepiness. You know, I mean, Mm -hmm. I just think I think some empathy there. I mean, it's certainly odd and unusual. And I think everyone has more questions about it. And that's understandable. But I think unless unless we're hearing from police that, oh, yeah, this is, you know, we think this person is involved. I kind of feel like we all just have to, you know. Yeah, we've, we've got to give this, this, this witness some sympathy and some grace and what's going on there. You know, most people, 100 percent of their interactions in life are not with murderers. And, and some people have 99.999 percent of their interactions with people who are not murderers, and that is this witness. And so you fall back on your past experiences to say, well, you know, this, this is odd, and he, this guy is creepy and he scares me a little bit. I'm going to go in my room and close the door. But you don't immediately jump to the idea that, oh, there was a murder. I mean, and, and you know, unless there was a lot of screaming, a lot of fighting going on, you know, then, then you do have to ask what's going on um, uh, with, with this witness. But 
yeah, your past experience informs you, uh, informs your current behavior. And, and this person just saw this individual and didn't think, didn't jump to the con- immediate conclusion there was crime that just occurred. And that's natural. We want to again thank our guests for speaking with us. We will continue to offer interviews with him and our other experts so that we can all come to a better understanding of the issues raised by this crime. Thanks so much for listening to The Murder Sheet. If you have a tip concerning one of the cases we cover, please email us at murdersheet at gmail.com. If you have actionable information about an unsolved crime, please report it to the appropriate authorities. If you're interested in joining our Patreon, that's available at www.patreon.com slash murdersheet. If you want to tip us a bit of money for records requests, you can do so at www.buymeacoffee.com slash murdersheet. We very much appreciate any support. Special thanks to Kevin Tyler Greenley, who composed the music for the murder sheet and who you can find on the web at kevintg.com. If you're looking to talk with other listeners about a case we've covered, you can join the Murder Sheet discussion group on Facebook. We mostly focus our time on research and reporting, so we're not on social media much. We do try to check our email account, but we ask for patience as we often receive a lot of messages. Thanks again for listening.